a definition of terrorism is necessary, as it's written here, based on the panel, we should have had a question mark, but I would leave it as it is, a fundamental counterterrorism measure. And uh, this is a task and a goal that I personally set to myself, but uh, I think that the international community should set as a goal to achieve, because we will never reach the level of international counterterrorism efficiency and international counterterrorism cooperation, which is needed not just to confront the terrorist attacks which we are facing today, but the new challenges of terrorism which is banging on our door. And it will not be that long until we will need to face them, and I refer to non-conventional terrorism, chemical, biological, and so on and so forth. We would never be able, actually, to get to the level of international counterterrorism efficiency which is needed to deal with that without agreeing on the basic issue what are we fighting against as a common denominator? There are two uh, main arguments against defining terrorism, and both of them were uh, expressed in the panel. One, well, it, it's maybe nice, it's good, good to have, but it's impossible. We will never reach an agreement. This is a very subjective term, and you cannot use objective tools to deal with this subjective term, and of course, the uh, slogan which is being used time and again in order to so-called uh, uh, um, justify this argument is one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Shows how subjective it is. If you fight against me, you are a terrorist. If you are doing the same things to others, you are a freedom fighter. I beg to differ and I will explain the difference at the end of my uh, presentation. The other argument, also we heard it here, not only we, that it's impossible, we deal, really don't need it. We fight against terrorism today quite successfully. We don't need it. We have international resolutions. The Security Council has international resolutions against terrorism. So why do we need to bother that? By the way, they don't even need to use the term terrorism because how do they deal with that? You have international resolutions against suicide attacks without necessarily using the term terrorism, against hijackings, kidnappings, all the criminal acts that terrorists are doing. If we will just criminalize those acts, we don't need to define what terrorism is. Seems reasonable, but it's not. I would argue, how can you really outlaw terrorist organization and accept that as, uh, as a rule, not just in one state, but in all states, without agreeing on what is terrorism all about? What is the definition of, of terrorism? How can you outlaw incitement for terrorism without defining what terrorism is? How can you judge anyone for being a member of a terrorist organization if you don't define what is terrorism? How can you extradite terrorists? And here we talk about international cooperation. How can you extradite or demand from a state to extradite a terrorist if you don't share the same definition of terrorism? How can you dry the the, uh, the monetary support of terrorist organizations that is flying from one state to another state, transfers of money and so on and so forth, if you don't agree on one definition of terrorism. How can you uh, argue that this or the other state is a state that sponsored terrorism if you don't agree what is terrorism all about? So in order to reach this and many other higher level of counterterrorism cooperation and activity, higher than it is today, you need a definition of terrorism, which will be internationally widely accepted. Yes, I know this uh, uh, operational mind. I, look, I came from the battlefield, and I know what is terrorism, because when anybody shoots me, I shoot back. I don't ask question: are you a terrorist, are you a guerrilla warfare, are you insurgent, who cares? I shoot back. Yes, that's true. In the battlefield, you don't ask questions. But when you're out of the battlefield, you need to start to ask those questions because you need to understand that countering terrorism only in the battlefield, in the middle of the battlefield, it's good, but it's not good enough. It's not going to cease terrorism. What would cease terrorism is a much higher level of strategic counterterrorism strategy. And without a definition of terrorism, we will never reach this level. The definition that I suggest to use is different from the definition that was proposed, but not that different is short, precise, and objective as much as possible. 
Terrorism is the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilians, no, not combatants, not uh, any person who is not taking part in hostilities, civilians, aimed against civilians or civilian targets in order to achieve political ends. And we can down drill and, and say which political ends, nationalistic, socio-economical, ideological, and religious political uh, goals. Because when somebody is trying to create, to uh, topple down regimes with the religious flag and create instead a caliphate state that will be run by the Sharia law, that's a religious political goal. So those are the pillars. This definition doesn't create a new uh, international moral uh, law or rule. Actually, it follows the logic, the moral logic of the international humanitarian law altogether the Geneva Conventions altogether, which differ between deliberate attack against military targets and deliberate attacks against civilian targets, which is forbidden in any uh, uh, situation. The definition that I suggest holds only three elements. The use of violence. Many definitions around the world are using the th terrorism is the use of violence or the threat to use of violence. Excuse me, the threat to use violence is not terrorism. The threat to use violence is the threat to use terrorism, which could be outlawed by itself, but it's not the felony, which is called terrorism. Against civilians, and here I would like to elaborate on, uh, uh, on that. A, not, as some definitions are using, not innocent civilian, civilians or civilian targets. Why? Because innocent and innocence is a subjective term. And civilians is an objective term which is defined in international uh, conventions, what is a civilian target and what is not. I don't accept the non-combatants concept. I don't accept not because I don't want to accept. Of course, I, I love the idea that uh, uh, any attack against my soldiers, IDF soldiers for that matter, would be regarded as terrorism. But I'm trying to achieve here a tool. I'm trying to achieve here a tool that will be widely accepted, not just between Richard Kemp and me, or Britain and Israel. It should be widely accepted by the international community, including third world countries, including people which identify with those terrorists, including people which support the goals that the terrorists are trying to achieve and maybe even see some of those terrorists as the, as the real representative, genuine representatives. I want to bring them to share with me the same definition and I'll explain how. So, non-combatants is not good enough for that, uh, for that purpose. Why? By the definition of non-combatants, United States do not refer, actually refers to the uh, attack against the warship, the call in 2002 in Yemen as terrorist act. I don't. It's a hostile act. It may be an act of war, but it's not a terrorist act. An attack against Israeli soldiers in Lebanon or uh, any, anywhere else, which is not necessarily in the immediate battlefield at that time, this is not terrorism. It's guerrilla warfare, it's insurgency, we can define it in so many other definitions, but it's not terrorism. Now listen to that. I'm not legitimizing that. Anyone who attack my soldiers is my enemy, and I have all the right in the world to fight back. My son is a soldier, anybody that will put his finger on him is my enemy. And I have all the right in the world to fight back, and maybe to, in a preventive measure, to kill him before he's uh, trying to kill my soldier. But from the moral aspect, this is totally different when they deliberately target military target and when they are uh, getting into a school, uh, schoolyard or kindergarten and butcher those kids. That's terrorism. Terrorism is a modus operandi. Terrorism is tactic. Terrorism is not a goal by itself. And this brings us back and we will uh, uh, go back to that. Actually, let's talk about it right now. That's, the problem is that the slogan, one man's terrorist is another man, uh, uh, freedom fighter, 
is being used by both ends of the spectrum. The terrorists are using that, and those which are uh, uh, raising the flag of counterterrorism are using that. The terrorists are saying, we are not terrorists because we are freedom fighters. The, those which are promoting counterterrorism are saying, and I will quote uh, Senator Henry Jackson, 1987, saying the following, the thought that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter is unacceptable. Freedom fighters or revolutionaries do not blow up buses with non-combatants. Terrorist murderers do. Freedom fighters do not kidnap and slaughter students. Terrorist murderers do. Excuse me. Freedom fighters are doing all of the above sometimes. So we need to differ between the goal, which is freedom fighting, or fighting for the freedom. The freedom is the goal. You want to uh, uh, um, get independence, to get rid of occupation. That's freedom. That's the goal. And if you are trying to achieve that, you are a freedom fighter. And between the means that you are using in order to achieve this goal. And the first thing you should ask, do, do the, you have the right to use violence? You know what? That's my personal perspective. I accept that some other people would say it's, uh, it's not conceivable. But from my point of view, I support any freedom fighter in the world. And I believe that any freedom fighter in the world has the right to use violence against an occupying state. He doesn't have the right to deliberately attack civilian targets, i.e. terrorists or terrorism. By the way, you immediately will translate it to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so I will explain my thoughts on that. From my point of view, and here I'm saying as an Israeli, I don't see Hamas nor Hezbollah as freedom fighters. Because we are the freedom fighters, they want to prevent their, our right to live in an independent Jewish state in this region. And they want to demolish a state and not fighting for the freedom. So on that, no doubt that we will never agree what is a just cause, what is a not just cause, what is real freedom fighting, what is not. You know what? It's not important. Because what is important is what the measure that you are going to achieve in order to promote what you believe is a just cause. Let me give you the definition of the Muslim World League that was given in 2001 in the Durban uh, meeting. The definition that I suggested to you hardly hold two lines. The definition of the Muslim World League is four pages. I will not bother you with the whole four pages. I will read only one or two articles. Terrorism is an outrageous attack carried out either by, either by individuals Groups, or Richard, for answering you, or states, against the human being, and now they elaborate, against his religion, against his life, against his intellect. If you say something stupid to me, this is terrorism, by the way, because you insult my intellect. Against his property, against his honor, I would buy that tomorrow morning. So, such a wide definition. Everything is terrorism. It includes all forms of intimidation, harm, threatening, killing. And listen to that. That's the, the, that's the, uh, the bottom line. Without a just cause. So if you have a just cause, you can do all of the above. You can kill, you can arson, you can insult, you can do whatever you want because you have a just cause. That's the essential need for the definition. Terrorism has nothing to do with goals. Terrorism is a tactic which should be always forbidden. You know what, my friends? On that, you might call me naive, but on that, we can agree internationally wise. I talked with Palestinians. I talked with uh, Muslims. I talked with people which do not recognize Israel. And on that, they can agree with me that the deliberate attack against civilian targets should be out of the question, even if you have a just cause. Because on the just cause, we probably are not going to agree uh, ever. Of course, this uh, definition raises not one, but many problems. And I'm not saying that it's bulletproof, 100%. I will raise some of them. 
One of them I already mentioned, which, which is the claim that by defining terrorism like that, you actually legitimize attacks against uh, military targets. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. What I do say, that anybody who attacks my soldiers is my problem, not necessarily the problem of the international community. But when somebody deliberately attacks my civilians, it should be regarded as an international problem and not an internal or local problem of any member uh, uh, or any state. What, uh, what is the question about, and, and it was raised, I think, by Richard as well, the question of uh, states. So if I'm right, this definition would also uh, have implications on states. Deliberate attack against civilians in order uh, to achieve, or civilian targets in order to achieve political ends, under this definition, the question is, what about states? Does states uh, conduct terrorism or not? And I'll give you a very sincere and direct Jewish answer. Yes and no. <laughs> now, why do I, what do I mean by yes and no? Yes, states can do terrorism. Yes, states can do atrocities. Sometimes states can do bigger atrocities than non-state or non-state actors because they have much more power. No, because we don't need to define the terrorism. It's already being defined by the international community as a crime, either a war crime or a crime against humanity. The paradox is that what is forbidden for states to do is not forbidden for non-state actors to do. That's why we need now to take what is the burden on the shoulder of the state and put this burden on the shoulder of the terrorist organizations. Okay, maybe I succeeded to persuade you on that point, but then you would say, okay, it's an it's a interesting academic drill. It doesn't have any real merit. Those terrorists doesn't think like you. They kill whoever they want. Look at that. Give me one organization today which is only deliberately attacking military personnel. They all do all of the above. Sometimes they kill uh, military targets, uh, uh, attack military targets. Sometimes they attack a civilian targets. So there is no merit for this definition. And I'm saying, why should those organizations deliberately attack military personnel? Why should those organizations make the decision to refrain from attacking civilians when the international community doesn't pose this as a threshold for them. I'm arguing, and I'm ready to debate anyone who thinks differently, that terrorist organizations are rational actors, at least in the level of the leadership of the organization. They calculate costs and benefits. They are choosing the alternative which they believe is more beneficial for their causes. Of course, their calculus is different than mine, but they have their own calculus. We should influence their calculus. We should induce our, our consideration, our, uh, our uh, measures in order to change the consideration. Now, I want the, this terrorist tomorrow morning, or the leader of the terrorist organization, which he decides that he wants to attack Israel, I want him to ask the question, should I attack military targets or should I attack civilian targets? What will be more beneficial for me to do? Right now, I'm telling you, it's much more beneficial to attack civilian targets. And you know why? A, it's easier. B, you get much more media attention. C, much less uh, possibility of being hurt in the attack. I want him to know that if he crosses this threshold, he is not becoming the enemy of Israel, he's becoming the enemy of the world. He cannot then uh, travel safely all over the world. There will not be a question if this organization then conducted that is the military arm or it's the uh, Department of Science and Technology of that group is a terrorist organization. The whole organization crossed the Rubicon River and becomes a terrorist organization and therefore being treated as such by the international community based on the international agreed objective definition. By the way, this threshold is not dynamic, it's, it's, it's very sustained, but the organization might cross from an organization that does not use terrorism, might use uh, violence but not terrorism, but might also go back. Once the organization, say tomorrow morning Hamas, come forward and based on that definition is saying, look, we hate Israel, we don't acknowledge the right of Israel to exist, and we are going to fight for our freedom. And we are going to use violence for that. But from now on, we are not going to deliberately attack civilian targets because it's immoral, because it's not beneficial, because, because, because. 
And uh, from that time on, it's not just an oral uh, statement. Actually, he dismantled the terrorist capabilities. He's preventing himself from launching those attacks. From that time on, I would not refer to Hamas as a terrorist organization. Still an enemy, by the way, but not the same kind of enemy that used to be before. I would understand that the international community see this organization in a different way. You know what? It might be sound weird to you. If you would pose this alternative to Hamas today, I'm not so sure that Hamas will not consider that seriously. Is this not counterterrorism? Is this is not an effective counterterrorism or an achievement that we would like to achieve? I beg to differ. I do think that this is a goal, a worthy goal. So I think, uh, I don't know if I was persuasive enough, but the heat was uh, definitely high. So uh, some of you might uh, think that I'm naive in this, uh, in this effort. Uh, I would say that maybe I'm, I'm naive. I think that the international community will be forced to achieve an international objective definition, hopefully along the lines of uh, those that I suggested. I think it will be forced because the challenge of terrorism is going to be much bigger, much more dangerous than what we used to know until recently, and there will be no other way but agreeing first and foremost what is terrorism and then take all this other political consideration out and be forced, even those that doesn't really want, those that states that today are sponsoring terrorism will be forced to be obliged to uh, the international norms and the international definition. Thank you very much.